Can I go to you back to you first and say you're hearing um, a proposal there, an agenda, you might almost say, for, from, from Alex, which talks about the way in which we can practically and meaningfully use these sorts of techniques uh, in a way that relates to our own personal experience, links to wider society. I mean, surely that's something we should all, all welcome. There's, there's nothing uh, problematic about that, is there? No, of course, there's nothing problematic about that. that uh, I mean, where, where, uh, and I, I, I'm not sure whether I'm inter interpreting mindfulness properly. Um, I would say that uh, that the the negative emotions are are often as useful as the positive ones. So if you're living in a very um, unequal uh, discriminatory society, then anger, um, it, although it may not always be as uh, useful in talking to cabinet ministers, as you said, um, it, it, it seems necessary to me. It seems necessary to be angry about inequality and about poverty and about overconsumption and um, all that kind of stuff. And, and so I would... I would argue f for the negative emotions to, to a large extent. I mean, not exclusively. I mean, I keep thinking of um, T.H. White, who wrote The Sword and the Stone. Mm. Uh, there's a wonderful line that Merlin has where he says, the best thing for being sad is to learn something. Mm. Um, you know, p a positive use of, of negative emotions. Uh, you know, who could argue with that? But on the other hand, I wouldn't want to get rid of um, rage in society, particularly when our society is so completely dysfunctional. Well, could I throw a version of that thought back to, to Peter? Because Peter, if you, as I understand it, when you look back at the original Buddhist texts from which what our contemporary idea of mindfulness is drawn from, a lot of them are really not at all about what the contemporary world makes mindfulness about, which is about calming down, breathing hard, providing positive emotions, they're actually about trying to avoid the terror of non-being. It's very much a kind of mitigation strategy rather than a positivity strategy. And I wonder if that's a useful way to try and link that question of responsibility, the fact that we have to actually acknowledge that there are many negative things in the world with what we can do personally and individually in terms of improving our own personal happiness. In other words, overcoming the temptation to look inward and say, I'm doing fine, the rest of the world can go hang. Yes. Um, well, it, well, I think what has happened here is that uh, mindfulness, as, as it's been presented, especially um, through the, what the, the translation, really, of the tradition um, into kind of secular and therapeutic registers through the work of uh, John Kabat-Zinn, for example, um, has tended to abstract part of the tradition um, and the receiving culture here, well, when I say here, sort of America, the UK, whatever, um, it's been received into a culture that has a history um, of uh, taking psychological uh, techniques, you know, the whole positive psychology movement, um, and tending to overemphasize uh, the need to cultivate the positive and uh, at the expense sometimes of uh, repressing or zoning out, you know, it's a, it, it can lead to a kind of a passive, rather individualized uh, opting out. Um, there is value, I think, in the possibility of cultivating less of an identification with these emotions, whether they're good or bad, and being able to respond more um, productively and maybe more critically in the world as well, um, if we're able to reduce our identification with these emotions and respond from a, a place of equanimity. But the limitations um, of mindfulness, once it's abstracted from that uh, ethical and much more complex psychology uh, that the Buddha and others have uh, offered us, the, the risk um, is that it, be, it becomes much more about the receiving culture than the original intention mm -hmm. of the, the, the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha lived in a time of great social upheaval, he, in many ways, was a, a very political character, you know, advising kings and involved, and he was, uh, you know, there were conspiracies and political conspiracies around him. And I think we need to be careful not to necessarily draw very literally from the original Buddhist texts, because they are texts of their time, 
But to understand that in translating, in receiving the teachings, they can be overwhelmed by our own uh, biases, our own culture. And I'm particularly interested in the way in which the mindfulness movement um, um, is a sign of the dominance of the attention economy, the way in which capitalism and neoliberalism has commodified and has begun to target our attention and has a massive influence on how we um, relate to ourselves, our own subjectivity. It can undermine um, our ability to direct attention and to um, maintain a sense of our own intention towards the world. The limitations of mindfulness yeah. are that they, they, they tend not to deal with that structural um, and uh, environmental um, imposition of a, a very low grade uh, uh, engagement with the world. Uh, Peter, could I put that point, um, take that point, and Alex put it to you. Is there a danger that mindfulness, as it happens in the real world today, is really a sort of commercialized process that has very little really to do with those wider, deeper, you know, non-individualistic roots that it uh, that it has in, in practice? Yeah, I can see both sides of that. Um, it's uh, a common criticism of mindfulness that mindfulness in itself is essentially amoral. You know, if you're a sniper in an army, you can become a better sniper by developing your concentration to the ability to kill someone. Um, that's, you know, uh, a criticism that's often leveled. I, 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 have, I also have some hope uh, around the mindfulness movement. I, I think there's particularly in the context of, say, corporations inviting people in um, to kind of teach mindfulness techniques within their organization. I think they might be inviting in more of a, a wolf into the flock than they, they necessarily realize. Uh, because as we go through a process of developing more introspective awareness, we become much more attuned to understanding what really matters to us and how we really feel about things. Those things are, are, then, are then increasing in our awareness. Those can become a kind of spark of motivation for change. We might choose to no longer be in that organization anymore once they're actually forced to actually encounter what it feels like, which we'd previously been repressing. Uh, so my hope is that actually, even in its most watered down form, there is some aspect of growing awareness that is in itself pulling people back towards what they really want in life. And we, we find this in, in happiness work as well. When you ask people, I think what's surprisingly radical about the question, you know, what really makes you happy is that as people start to look into the, their sources of happiness, they tend to find over and over again that it's their connections with other people. It's all this stuff that is not within the sphere of the kind of uh, capitalist machine of wanting you to, to buy and consume more stuff. That's uh, Everybody kind of knows when they, when they come into it with awareness that that stuff doesn't really work. It doesn't make you happy. Uh, but the things that do are con our connection with nature, our connection with one another, uh, our sense of kind of efficacy and agency in the world. All of those things, when if we acted and lived from those, all of us all the time, we'd be living in a very different society and I imagine would build very different systems to sustain it. Thanks for that, Alex. Let, let me turn a little bit for the last part of our discussion to uh, the future, both the near future and what emerges uh, beyond that. And this wider question of whether or not what we see at the moment is going to stay with us. So Meg, I wonder if I might turn to you on, on this, because you'll know, we, we all know that over the years and the decades, various sorts of ideas about personal health, well-being um, have risen and fallen. Some of them have stayed with us. In the Western world, vegetarianism was not a particularly widespread uh, phenomenon, I would say, until probably the late 19th, early 20th century when it started to take off, but it's still very much with us and going gangbusters. On the other hand, certain other types of ways of thinking about the body and space, particularly uh, nudism, to, to give an example that was very big in uh, East Germany in the 1970s, specifically, uh, as, as it happens, uh, has possibly become less um, uh, uh, less popular in, in recent years, although climate change may, may change that. In other words, looking at the wider perspective, do you see the sort of whole set of debates about mindfulness, about thinking about the self in this way, self in this way, as part of a set of trends on personal mental health that rise and fall? Or is this one a keeper? Is this one here to stay, do you think? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit IAI.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.